So in this final part of the lecture, I will uh, solve the Cooper problem, which is a problem of uh, weakly attractive uh, electrons near the Fermi surface that uh, form uh, pairs, so-called Cooper pairs, bound states of two electrons. And as we discussed, uh, these uh, Cooper pairs, they, at low temperatures, they both condense into Bose-Einstein condensate which becomes superfluid, and this uh, is this amazing state that we know as a superconductor. Uh, I should mention that, as we will see, actually, the solution to the Cooper problem will involve um, uh, essentially the same method we used uh, in the uh, first lecture this week in the context of single particle quantum mechanics. So it's going to be actually very simple, technically a very simple solution for a Nobel Prize winning work anyway. So it's not trivial, but you know, this is a very important work. So here I'm actually showing the, uh, the title of the original paper by Leon Cooper. So, uh, uh, and um, uh, this work of Cooper eventually uh, has uh, progressed, has developed into a much more sophisticated theory, which is uh, the bargain cooper schiffer theory of superconductivity, or so-called BCS theory. So, and this uh, BCS theory has been uh, the cornerstone of the theory of superconductivity for many, many years. And frankly, there is nothing better uh, on the market uh, in, in some sense. So, this uh, BCS theory describes uh, very well uh, most uh, conventional superconductors and it provides some understanding uh, also in uh, the physics of um, uh, unconventional superconductors, although they're uh, such as the high temperature superconductors, for example, although there the understanding is not uh, complete. Uh, now, as I, uh, well, I've shown many times already citations for various Nobel Prizes, and I discussed uh, briefly uh, a number of Nobel Prize winning works, and I should admit, I should admit that in most of these cases I had to uh, sort of uh, simplify things enormously when I was providing explanations, sort of dump it down to some degree. So here, well, I'm not going to discuss BCS theory, this is a very complicated theory, but the um, uh, paper of Cooper is actually very, very simple. So the original paper which started it all is very simple, and we will be able to understand uh, essentially its main message and the derivation. Now, um, but before going into this derivation, uh, let me uh, discuss uh, the origin of uh, this uh, attractive interaction. So I basically, what I, what I want to solve again is a problem of electrons interacting by an attractive potential. But where exactly it's coming from? So this is actually a very complicated and tricky question. And, well, in some sense, the mystery of, let's say, high temperature superconductivity is in that we don't really know where this sort of blue, this uh, attractive interaction might be coming from. So the, the origin of uh, electron attraction in conventional superconductors uh, is also uh, far from obvious, actually. So, but uh, there was a breakthrough paper back in the beginning of the 50s, uh, so I'm showing here the title of this paper, uh, Superconductivity in isotop Isotopes of Mercury. And to appreciate the importance of this paper, let me just remind you uh, the basic picture of uh, what a metal is. So, uh, well, if you have a metallic system, uh, well, a solid system, so uh, the reason it's a solid is because uh, the ions uh, form a crystal lattice. So they're position, positioned in space in a regular fashion. So I'm just drawing here, for the sake of simplicity, a square lattice in 2D, but in reality it's, uh, it could be a, a more complicated three-dimensional lattice. And uh, you should think about having a positive uh, ions sitting uh, here, in, in these um, sides, on these lattice sides. And uh, this lattice is a sort of elastic, well, it's a rigid object, but it can have uh, oscillations, uh, waves running through it. And uh, we're going to discuss it a little bit uh, in, uh, the, uh, few, in a few weeks. And so these oscillations of the lattice are called phonons. Now, uh, electrons in the metal are uh, moving, uh, moving around, they're free to move around, but they move around in the, uh, on the background of this lattice. So these red guys here are electrons, okay? And so this is pretty much what, well, a spherical cow model, a simplified, oversimplified model of uh, a metallic solid. Now, um, uh, so this paper, what, 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 what this paper has achieved is that it looked at different uh, isotopes of mercury, which is a superconductor, and uh, uh, let me remind you that isotopes are essentially different versions of the same ke chemical elements. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, basically uh, everything is the same for different isotopes apart from the number of neutrons uh, 
in each ion sitting on the lattice side. So, but basically, so different isotopes means that everything is the same, but the only difference is the mass of these objects on the lattice sides, which, uh, well, naively shouldn't affect uh, too much uh, superconductivity, because clearly superconductivity is coming from whatever electron, electrons are doing, and it shouldn't uh, have much to do with the lattice, right? So, because these guys uh, are actually, well, they can oscillate a little bit near their equilibrium positions, but they cannot conduct uh, electricity. So, but it turned out, and this is really the main message of the paper, that uh, the um, transition temperature into the superconductor, the temperature at which the resistivity drops exactly to zero, depended uh, very strongly on the uh, mass of these guys, okay? So, and the heavier uh, the uh, ions, the lower was the transition temperature. So here, maybe it's hard to see, so there are a few points. Uh, so this says average mass number and this says transition temperature. So this is basically, let me write it, Tc, and this is the mass uh, of these uh, uh, ions uh, on lattice size. Okay, and uh, so this was a very clear cut uh, trend and it uh, was a smoking gun of that uh, su superconductivity had something to do with the uh, uh, interactions between the electrons and the crystal lattice. So and a little later, people uh, realized that what actually happens is that uh, this, uh, these electrons moving around, they, uh, wh whenever the electron passes through a region in a lattice, so essentially because electrons are negatively charged and the ions uh, sitting on lattice size are positively charged, so this electron polarizes the lattice, okay, so uh, locally, and it takes some time uh, for the lattice sort of to relax back, and then if a second electron comes in, so let's say I have here now this guy goes away and there is a second electron which comes in into the same uh, region, so uh, this uh, electron, second electron is attracted in some sense to, uh, uh, to this region and um, this uh, results in an effective correlation, effective uh, phonon mediated attraction between the electrons. So it's a very tricky business, so I, if you don't understand it, well, don't be surprised. I don't understand it either, actually. So, but that's how it works. So we'll have to, you know, just accept this fact. So that what happens is that electrons, in some sense, they exchange waves, uh, elastic waves, uh, uh, which are called phonons, and this leads to effective attraction. Well, and uh, by the way, for the model, for the actual solution I'm going to present, uh, the origin of the attraction doesn't matter that much. Uh, it will be just some attraction, some constant, uh, minus V0, but, uh, you know, it's good to know the uh, physics behind it. For the actual calculation, we'll need a specific mathematical model of this uh, electron-electron attraction. And uh, the true attraction, the true interaction is actually quite complicated. But, um, so here I will present uh, what I call a spherical cow model of this phonon-mediated attraction between electrons. Uh, which uh, I should say actually is uh, used commonly even in research papers, so it works perfectly well. And uh, even though we know how to write the true uh, model, uh, which would involve all the complications of the theory, so the results, the outcomes of the uh, simplified model and the more complicated model uh, are pretty close to each other. So there is really no reason for us to complicate things. So in any case, um, so what we're, what we're talking about is that, again, electrons uh, moving around uh, in, in, in the presence of a crystal lattice, they exchange uh, uh, waves running through the lattice, these phonons. And um, so this uh, diagram is an example of a Feynman-like diagram which shows this, uh, this kind of exchange. And uh, in any process like this, uh, we must uh, satisfy basic conservation laws. Uh, and in particular, we must ensure that both energy and momentum are conserved. So, uh, and uh, therefore, uh, what's important here uh, in understanding the structure of this interaction is the uh, typical energies involved in the, such processes. So what we know, what we already discussed, is the, uh, the typical energy of the electrons in the, uh, in the metal. So, and this typical energy, you know, uh, I denote it as E sub F, the Fermi energy, divided by the Boltzmann constant, sort of to convert it into a more um, familiar temperature units, so the corresponding typical sort of temperature of electrons is going to be about 10,000 Kelvin. So these guys, which actually the main players uh, of the theory, uh, have uh, the energy which is associated with this temperature scale. Now, it turns out that the phonons, uh, it's not obvious from the previous discussion, it's not uh, something we can derive. I'm just sort of giving you an experimental fact is that 
if uh, the typical energy of the phonons, uh, which I will call as h times uh, omega d by, so called d by frequency divided by the Boltzmann constant, so when converted into temperature, is about 400 Kelvin. You know, a few hundred Kelvin. So, which is uh, two orders of magnitude smaller than the energy of the electrons. So, what we should think about is that these phonons actually being exchanged by the electrons have uh, energy which is much, much smaller than the energy, like uh, the electron energy itself. And uh, this uh, puts uh, certain constraints on the possible um, uh, momenta and energies of the electrons that may experience this sort of a process. And the simplest uh, sort of uh, version of the introduction which takes this into account is uh, presented here. So this is an equation for uh, an interaction, momentum dependent interaction between the two electrons, V of P. And what it tells us is that the two uh, electrons uh, attract each other in this uh, language if they are located uh, in a narrow shell near the Fermi surface and the width of the shell is of the order of this um, uh, phonon energy. So basically if uh, two electrons can exchange phonons they do so and this results in the attraction which is manifested here through this negative coefficient and V0 is some uh, constant. And if uh, two electrons are located, uh, well, beyond this uh, sh uh, narrow region, so then they don't have a mechanism to attract each other and their interaction therefore is zero. So uh, if we look just uh, at the uh, upper part, so V of P is equal to minus V uh, zero, so this uh, would uh, correspond to essentially a local uh, attraction in real space. So this is something we actually saw in uh, 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 lecture number five for the delta potential. So this is the kind of problem we uh, discussed already. And, um, but however, then uh, we were talking about uh, you know, one particle in a, uh, in, a, in a quantum well. So now we're talking about two particles, two excitations interacting with each other by this potential. But, uh, per, uh, well, per the results of the previous uh, segment in this lecture, we know that the two-particle problem in quantum mechanics is uh, to a large degree equivalent uh, to a, a single-particle quantum mechanical problems. And as we discussed in uh, the previous video, the only difference uh, between the uh, single-particle problem and a potential B of R and a uh, two-particle problem uh, of uh, two particles interacting by, by the same potential is that in the latter we will uh, get uh, the reduced mass uh, instead of the mass of, a of each individual particle. And in the case of two identical electrons, uh, the reduced mass is equal to m over 2, so we, ha we, see we have uh, simply this Schrodinger equation. And uh, here I write it first in real space, sort of, but keeping in mind that there are in fact additional constraints on the interaction. So if we do, um, if we follow the same route that we did in lecture number five and do Fourier transform, so um, we uh, can write this uh, equation in this form. So delta of r acting on psi of r uh, picks up psi of zero. And so here I'm going to have this integral over uh, all momenta, but basically a way to uh, introduce constraints on uh, the potential that we just discussed would be uh, to limit the integration over momentum here by uh, only momenta that uh, appear in the vicinity of the Fermi surface, uh, you know, uh, so that the uh, possibility of a uh, phonon exchange exists. And so this uh, equation, essentially these two equations with the appropriate sort of caveats about where the interaction is possible is exactly the Cooper pairing problem. And as you can see, it's essentially identical uh, mathematically to the kinds of problems we saw in uh, lecture number five in uh, single particle quantum mechanics. And so, well, we can, uh, we can follow the same route, but uh, at, uh, at this stage, we may be a little bit surprised uh, by this uh, resemblance, because uh, I mentioned that this eventually the result of this calculation is going to be the appearance of a bound state between the two electrons. But uh, as we discussed, weak attraction in um, uh, three dimensions, and this is a three-dimensional problem, does not result in a bound state. So a delta function potential in 3D does not have a bound state. Uh, however, an interesting thing that happens here is that uh, because uh, electrons that really play a role in uh, this uh, pairing and this uh, interaction with phonons, they exist in the vicinity of this Fermi surface, and this surface is two-dimensional, 
this uh, gives rise in a sense to a reduction of dimensionality even though in real space we started with a three-dimensional uh, system so this effectively uh, what we're dealing with with here has a reduced dimension and uh, this gives rise to uh, the appearance of a bound state in a very unexpected way so um, to see this, uh, we essentially have to repeat exactly the same steps as we did in parts three and four uh, of lecture number five. So, so the only difference here is uh, due to the fact that this energy in the left hand and the right hand side that we want to find really consists of two parts. So this is uh, the energy of the electrons that already have a finite energy at the at the Fermi surface. So remember that we're talking here about these excitations that uh, have the energy of 2 E Fermi and then there is an energy due to uh, the interaction which uh, we want to be negative. So if this guy delta is negative it means that we can have form a bound state uh, and by doing so lowering lower the energy. So um, and uh, well this uh, fact actually makes all the difference. Actually this is how mathematically uh, the fact that we are dealing with this two-dimensional Fermi surface manifests itself in this equation. Since the remaining calculation follows almost one-to-one -one, uh, that in uh, lecture number five, and I also present uh, this uh, particular calculation, all the details uh, in additional materials, so you can read through this. So I'm not going to repeat this uh, again in this video. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just present the final result for this uh, uh, key parameter delta, which again is the energy of the bound state of two electrons that form sort of a, a large uh, molecule if you want, which is called Cooper pair here. So, and this delta is going to be uh, of the order of minus h omega d. So this is a uh, phonon energy, typical phonon energy that we discussed in the previous slide. But the key thing here is that there is multiplied by an exponential of minus one, some constant, I'll call it n naught and define it in a second, times v naught. So where n naught uh, is equal to m p Fermi, so this is uh, this uh, threshold momentum divided by four pi squared uh, h cube. So this is just some constant, but what I want to emphasize, well, first of all, there is a solution, which is great. So the electrons indeed can find a way to lower their energy by forming these uh, bosonian Cooper pairs that eventually form the superconductor. Uh, but what is not so great is that this uh, small interaction energy appears in the exponential in, as minus one or V naught. So if V naught is uh, small, then, well, the uh, energy of the bound state, uh, the so-called superconducting gap is exponentially small. And this is exactly what happens. And those of you who followed uh, uh, all uh, segments in lecture number five can recognize this result as a result that we have seen actually in the context of two-dimensional single particle problem. And this uh, reflects this reduction in dimensionality that I uh, mentioned uh, before. So the last two things I'm going to mention in the end is, uh, first of all, this result for delta as a function of v naught is a very unusual function. Which, which we have already seen, but uh, this function is, again is special because it doesn't have a Taylor expansion. So there is no way one can approach this result by doing so-called perturbation theory. And this may be one of the reasons why uh, it took so long for people to figure out the uh, key to superconductivity, because there was no way to approach it sort of in a perturbative way. And the last thing I'm going to mention is that, well, if we did not have this uh, exponential, if we were to imagine that this uh, delta uh, was of the order of this uh, phonon energy, this would have actually implied that we can get uh, superconductivity uh, at very high temperatures, up to room temperature. So this would have been great. We would have the ability to uh, transport uh, electricity with no losses. So uh, this is really the grand uh, challenge in the field. So how to go beyond this weak coupling, so-called weak coupling, pairing model, so how to, uh, first of all, describe uh, the situation where the interactions are strong and how to enhance, how to get rid of this exponential, essentially. This is a sort of a practical problem that has no solution at the moment.